Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on a very beautiful uh, summer day uh, in Istanbul. And I hope you're enjoying uh, the beautiful weather, whatever part of the world you are. And uh, I am uh, delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Zehra Tombu. Uh, Zehra is an architect by training. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from the architecture department of Istanbul Technical University and continued her studies at the Cambridge University in UK, where she obtained a master's of philosophy degree in history and philosophy of architecture. In 2018, Zehra received her PhD degree from Boğaziçi University's history department with a co-advisorship of the department of art history at the University of Vienna. Uh, her dissertation, entitled The Art Historiographical Odyssey of Antipas, was supported by the Turkish Cultural Foundation and, of course, American Research Institute in Turkey. Back in 2015, she was a Huntman and Melling uh, Fellow. Uh, currently, uh, she's an assistant professor of history and theory of architecture at Istinia University in Istanbul. And her research focuses on Islamic and Oriental art historiography turn of the century intellectual history, modernism studies, as well as the relation between the natural sciences and humanities. And uh, in the past few years, uh, her publications were um, featured in publications such as the Journal of Art Historiography and the Reshaping of Persian Art, Art Histories of Islamic Iran and Central Asia. And uh, today, Zeyda is going to present us her research on uh, art historiography, which is actually a part of her uh, PhD dissertation. And uh, just uh, right uh, before we started the program, we were you know, talking about the time when we first met each other in person back in 2015, when she was in Washington, D.C. as a Hoffman Fellow. And she told me, actually, it was uh, the time that uh, she was you know, looking into the uh, letters and the documents on Arts and uh, Ernst Herzfeld uh, that she's going to present us today. So after many years, I'm really, really delighted to hear her, um, the outcome of her research of that time. And uh, as, um, um, as the title of, the, uh, of her talk suggests, uh, she's going to unpack the term Oriental refugees and will look into the uh, lives and careers of Ernst Herzfeld and Ernst Dies. So without further ado, I would like to uh, give the mic to Zehra. Thank you, Zeynep. Uh, thank you for having me, inviting me. Uh, to have this talk. It's a topic very dear to me. Uh, it's based on, as you said, on my doctor research, uh, which was supported by American Research Institute in Turkey, Turkish Cultural Foundation, and Prussian Art Culture Visits uh, in Germany, uh, Prussian Cultural Foundation. And the title is Oriental Refugees and Academical Geographical History. Uh, the doctoral thesis, uh, which turned out, uh, out to have the title, The Art Historiographical Odyssey of Ernst Dietz, was a history of art historiography of the first half of the 20th century from the point of view of Oriental studies and based on the biographical and academic journey of Ernst Dietz from Vienna to United States and to Turkey. He obtained his doctoral dissertation on, at the University of Graz in 1902, then became a volunteer at the Berlin Museum to Frederick Zarr. Uh, he started as at the University of Vienna as assistant to Josef Strzegowski, uh, became uh, a lecturer in uh, the art history of the Orient in 1919, uh, then uh, Extraordinaris Professor Extraordinaris in 1924, from where he went to Bryn Mawr College uh, in the United States in 1926, where he stayed until 1939. Uh, then for a brief period between 1939 and 1943, he returned to the University of Vienna, uh, from where he came to Turkey, 
1943 and stayed here at uh, teaching at the Istanbul University Department of Art History until 1949. Uh, it was a big, uh, let me, okay. Uh, Dietz's position as a lecturer of art history of the Orient, uh, as professor of study of historical monuments of the Orient, uh, traced the emergence of art historical studies of the Orient and its cross-border shifts and adaptations from the context of pre-First World War Austria and Germany to interwar United States and to 1940s Turkey. Dietz was the writer of the pioneering book on Islamic art in German language, dating to 1915. We see here on the slide titled uh, The Art of the Islamic People, the Kunst der Islamischen Volker. And while his work focused on Islamic art, it covered other topics of Orient, the definition of which also changed throughout the first decades of the 20th century and included Persian, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, and finally Turkish art and architecture. While researching on his years at the United States between 1926 and 1939, I came across letters of Ernst Hatzfeld at the Freer and Sackler Gallery uh, of the Smithsonian Institute, a scholar from the same generation of Dietz, only a year younger, whose scholarship was intertwined with Dietz in many ways as the first generation to work on art historical topics of Orient. The letters I came across uh, dated to years between 1935 to 1947, when Hersfeld was mainly in the United States as a member at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. The letters expressed personal reflections of the changes, transformations and displacement uh, that the scholarship went through. Herzfeld had his doctoral degree at the University of Berlin in 1907, had his habilitation in historical geography and art history of the Orient in 1909, and became a professor of archaeology of the Orient at the University of Berlin in 1917. His scholarship was based on archaeological excavations, and he became an advisor to Reza Khan during the 1920s. Here you see a map of his expeditions, surveys, and excavations he undertook covering the geographies of the Near East and might be viewed as the Orient of Hersfeld's scholarship. The course of the 20th century set parallel paths for both Dietz and Hersfeld, and the biographical journeys of these scholars crossed roads at revealing instances. Initially, at the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin, both were volunteers between 1908 and 1910 for the pioneering exhibition on Islamic art that took place in Munich in 1910. As assistants of Friedrich Zar, the director of the Islamic section of the museum. Their biographical journeys appear to have intersected thereafter in the United States in the mid 1930s where Dietz had been teaching at the Bryn Mawr College while Hersfeld had come uh, in, arrived in 1936. And lastly, in 1946, their roads crossed in Istanbul, where Dietz was teaching at Istanbul University and Hersfeld was on a revisit in view of settling after his retirement from the United States. This last crossroads is revelatory of how journeying, including surveys, excavations, were formative of biographical journeys of these scholars and their academic migrations through political changes between different countries appears as the transfiguration of these expedition geography. I take this expedition photograph as emblematic of the biographies of these scholars through both academic and political borders. It is from an expedition that Ernst Dietz undertook to northeastern Persia between 1912 and 1914, just before the First World War. Uh, 
Dietz was sent to this expedition by the director of the one of the two art historical institutes at the University of Vienna, his professor Strzegowski, in aim to develop a handbook on Islamic art, which would be geographically centered in Northeast Persia as a crossroads of an assumed Asian influence on the Near East. This hypothesis was formative of the two fractions of Islamic art historical scholarship in the vigor of the first decades of the 20th century, and Herzfeld would be at the other side of this fraction, claiming sources of Islamic art within antiquity. The expedition was made possible by the expedition of Bavarian lieutenant and also geographer Oskar von Niedermeyer from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, who was sponsored by the Minister of War. The official purpose of Niedermeyer's expedition was written to be geological, geographical, and ethnographical, and he indeed wrote his doctoral dissertation entitled The Inner Basins of the Iranian Plateau, based on this expedition, yet the sponsorship by the Minister of War and Niedermeyer's second trip to Afghanistan during 1915-1916 revealed its intertwined political framework. The expeditions were thus intricately linked to world politics that worked through geographies of political and cultural mappings. The transformation of these geographies into national borders through the two world wars was formative of the later change of the scholarship. The biographies of its scholars thus reveal a layered political and intellectual history, and they feel as Oriental refugees, as I referred in the title, uh, a term Dietz used in his letter to Ernst Kühnel, the director of the Berlin Museum of Islamic Arts in the 1930s, whilst he pointed out how Arthur Upumpop's survey and also Institute of Persian Arts aided them. I take two dates as parallel revelations of this history. One is Herzfeld's obligatory journey uh, out of Iran in 1935, and the other is criticisms Dietz faced in Turkey in 1946 Istanbul on his book on Turkish art, in consequence of which, as it appears, that he had to leave Turkey three years later in 1949. Herzfeld was in Iran after the First World War by the funds provided uh, from Germany, uh, collected by Frederick Zara himself, and later as, as advisor to Ruzahan uh, with the title Specialist in Oriental Studies. He ran excavations at Pasargad in 1928, at Sistan in 1929, at Samara in September 1930, and finally at Persepolis between 1931 and 1934. Herzfeld's work at Persepolis proved to be central for Iranian nationalism, as it signified a pre-Islamic site of Iranian rule, which was an important part of Reza Han's politics. It was from and because of Persepolis that Herzfeld had to leave Iran in December 1934. Herzfeld explains in a letter to the American scholar Myron Bennett Smith, dating to the August of 1935, that his deportation was an aftermath of both personal and political denunciations from the Minister of Public Institutions of Iran. Ali Musavi, in his article, Ernst Herzfeld Politics and Antiquities Legislation in Iran, discusses that Herzfeld had to depart Iran after a reaction to his handling of the excavation artifacts. It depicts Herzfeld's presenting of two sculptures from the Persepolis excavation to Gustav Adolf, the Crown Prince of Sweden, who was on a trip to the site to have provided a case for the Iranian reaction. And Gunther and Stefan Hauser, in the book Ernst Herzfeld and Near Eastern Studies, refer to internal expedition troubles with the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute that was funding the excavation, as well as problems with the Iranian government over the division of the fines in explaining the dismissal. In the same year, in 1935, 
Herzfeld was forced into early retirement from the University of Berlin as well because of his Jewish roots. The journey out of Iran appears to have unfolded both as an exile and as an odyssey. His library and belongings under scrutiny out of the country, traveling from country to country, restless and without work. He tells in a letter to Myron Bennett Smith, uh, dating to the June of that year from London. I must tell you my prayer, I quote, I must tell you my peregrinations. Somehow in March, I left New York for Algiers, could not stand it more than a week, tried Naples only two hours, went to Berlin with a fortnight of influenza, then about 12 days in London from Moscow, Leningrad. It was cold and I resolved to go to Istanbul via Kiev, but Istanbul was not restful. So I left via Venice, Paris two days, supreme enormous heat wave, and since yesterday, London. It's the only place where I can stay and while without work, for that is the reason for all this unrest. Quite personally, I want to tell you that I should be content not to go back to Berlin. But on the other hand, I should prefer not to be compelled to live, for instance, near New York for good. Nevertheless, he ends up at Princeton University's Institute of Advanced Studies with a fellowship from the Committee in Aid of Displaced German Scholars. Ominously, the feeling of displacement seems to have emerged at the instant of his leave of Iran and to have never left him in the United States. Gunther and Hauser point out, I quote, although revered at Princeton and New York, Herzfeld harbored a genuine dislike of life in the United States. We know from a letter from Dietz also to Smith that Dietz met Herzfeld in New York in 1935, on which he wrote that he found him Iran Nide, tired of Iran. I quote, I met Herzfeld a few weeks ago in New York. After all, he has the right to be rather tired of staying in the East, but he had no plans settled yet for his future. In a letter dating to 1946 to Richard Ettinghausen, Herzfeld refers in a nostalgic tone to the inspiring talks with Halil Bey of Istanbul, Nuri Pasha of Baghdad, Firuz Mirza of Tehran, which he missed in the United States and found revoked in his talk to Albert Einstein and Heinrich Seyrig. I quote, in spite of the total different background, it was quite enough to start a sentence to be understood immediately. And the subjects were high science, high politics and religion. So it was always when, for instance, talking to Halil Bey or to old Nuri Pasha from Baghdad or to Firuz Mirza in Tehran, when having a talk with Seyrig, it's the same. A hint and intonation is enough to agree and to be understood. There is nothing more tedious and irritating, irritating than being forced continuously to explain the values one connects with words and notions and to produce only the answer. I never looked at it that way. He knew Ettinghausen who was 20 years his junior from Berlin Museum of Islamic Art, where Ettinghausen was assistant between 1929 and 1931. Ettinghausen himself had migrated to the United States in 1934, initial to work at Pope's Institute of Persian Art and Archaeology, and from 1938 as an associate professor at the University of Michigan, and in 1944 had joined the Freer Gallery. In another letter to Ettinghausen, dating to the April uh, of the same year, he writes about his disillusions with the institutions he has been working with. You are right in many ways. One lives in phases of disillusions and reaches points where the urge to change things is so great that one does something instead of nothing. Therefore, beginning a new phase of disillusion. I think of my connection with the Orient Institute Chicago in 1930, the Institute of Princeton in 1936, this time, 1946, it will be the last disillusion. The world has changed. There is no way back 
Those to whom I looked up are gone, and I hate but cannot help looking down, a thing that poisons one's mind. At this point, uh, this dates to 1946, uh, by the way. At this point, Hirschfeld had already planned to sell his belongings, his library, along with his collection of artifacts, carpets, and household furnishings, in view of making a revisit to the Orient of his scholarship and also settling there. He went to Istanbul, Ankara, Aleppo, Damascus, the, from there moved to Beirut, to Cairo. Yet his intention for settling turned contrarywise, uh, as his impressions of this trip was of melancholy and of estrangement. In a letter to Ettingerhausen, dating to August 1946, Hersfeld writes, yet the general impression is very melancholic. All the beautiful things have either disappeared or are restored not to be recognized. Most revealing is his letter to Marie Zar, wife of Frederick Zar, dating to December of 1946. He refers back to his leave of Persepolis in 1935 as a similar odyssey and writes that he thought of staying at Constantinople but was disillusioned with what he called the ugly transition and modernization. I quote, I have thought very much of Constantinople, but apart from the still absurdly high life costs, most more expensive than New York, the whole Orient has changed very much there. Certainly the changes also in itself, but the modernization which began 30 years ago is so advanced that everything is now in a very ugly transition, something half, in Constantinople and in Ankara, I was invited by the universities and museum people, and by many of whom I had not known, only it was only all new people. Halil or a Halil was missing. Here he refers, of course, to Halil Etan, the director of the Archaeology Museum, who had passed away in 1938. Dietz was also in Istanbul in 1946, teaching at Istanbul University. He had accepted the position in 1943 after the suggestion of Ernst Kühnel and after ministerial correspondences between Ankara and Berlin. Nevertheless, a year after his arrival, due to Germany's defeat at the end of the Second World War and Turkey siding with the Allies, Dietz was interred among other German nationals in Turkey between September 1944 and December 1945, later part of which he spent in Kirşehir. Dietz wrote the book Turkish Art from its origins until today during his internment after a request from the Dean as a handbook for his teaching his student at Vienna University and assistant at Istanbul University, Oktay Astanapa, translated the book from German into Turkish. The book was nevertheless subject to severe criticisms that aimed at Dietz's depiction of Byzantine, Islamic, and Armenian connections to Turkish art. The criticisms began in December of 1946. Architect Sedat Çetintaş and Topkapı Museum director Tahsin Öz wrote columns on the topic in the daily newspapers. Initially in Cumhuriyet, Çetintaş condemned the book in an article titled A New Assault on the History of Our Civilization. A foreign professor at Istanbul University shows Armenian art as a source for Turkish architecture. I quote, we would not have been surprised had Professor Dietz demonstrated the origins of Turkish architecture in Arabic, Iranian, and Byzantine sources, as was the case with the old conservative authors. The professor found a separate and completely new and more functional father to Turkish architecture, Armenian architecture, and even as a support to it, he also mentions Georgian architecture. The criticisms transformed into a campaign, and within five days, Tassinoz wrote in Jumuriet with the title, Professor Dietz has to prove his claims. 
Öz described these discussions as an outsider's preconceptions. Dietz responded in a column two days later, again in Jumuriyet, after a visit to its editor-in-chief, Nadir Nadi. His answer reads as primarily a defense of Çetin Tash's attack on foreign scholarship. He points out how foreign scholars were formative in the establishment of the art historical knowledge on the region. He claimed his own role as author of 12 books and a teacher of Islamic art, both in Europe and the United States. In answer to the criticisms, Dietz referred to the concepts of adoption, appropriation, and fusion as traits of great art. Nadir Nadi wrote an editorial in support of Dietz, dismissing the accusations as personal complexes. The campaign never, nevertheless continued in other newspapers. Within the 10 days of Dietz's columnar, Techetintas wrote in Vatan this time with the title, Suleimani is not a replica of Hagia Sophia. Tassinet Öz wrote in Akşam, criticizing Dietz's discussions of an Turkish Islamic state art as a, I quote, myth on the Orient. The campaign appears to have come to a halt with a column of Çetintaş in the Akşam of January 1947, titled Intention or Negligence. Çetintaş recapped his initial criticism on foreign scholarship and on generational difference. He distinguished between friends and prejudiced foreigners. In this final column, Çetintaş, dem Çetintaş demanded Dietz's job at the university to be suspended as he accused the book of, I quote, content that is able to pervert the Turkish youth on its own civilization history, end of quote. This confrontation was framed by the contested political milieu in Turkey after the Second World War, caught in between communism and nationalism. The criticisms coincided with the turn of events in the Turanism racism court state case in favor of the 23 politicians who were initially accused of racism and Turanism. The case took place between 1944 and 1947, and just before the publication of Dietz's book in, the sept in September of 1946, the case took a turn in favor of the Turkists as a second set of hearings beginning of, on August 1946. The course of the case appears to have determined the later political atmosphere. And soon after in 1947, there was another court case against four professors from Ankara University's Faculty of Philology, History and Geography. This time on a charge of, I quote, discouraging the nationalist tendencies of their students and promoting leftism in their classrooms, end of quote. Although acquitted of all charges, Partev Nahili Boratav, Behije Boran, Niazi Berkes and Muzaffer Sherif Başoğlu were dismissed from their positions. The universities were a contested ground of politics, also in relation to the change in their structuring during the same period. Just before Dietz's book in June 1946, uh, appointment of new scholars became possible by the decision of the university Senate, Senate which put the foreign professors in the aim of uh, Turkish uh, professors. The criticisms were markers of the confrontation of the geographies of Oriental studies with the nationalist cultural and political remappings through the political changes of the first half of the 20th century. The criticisms on Dietz's book coincided with Herzfeld's trip in 1946, his letters to Marie Zahr and Ettinghausen, and appears as an ultimate dismissal with fin de siècle intellectual and academical milieu. It was again in this year and in the November-December issue of Ars Islamic of 1946, that Herzfeld wrote an obituary for Frederick Zahr, who had passed away in the previous year in May 1945, and to whom both Dietz and Herzfeld assisted at the beginning of their academic careers. The obituary is a lament 
for, a, for German scholarship in the aftermath of the Second World War. Herzfeld identifies the Berlin-based scholarship through Zar's library as a living tradition of 300 years and stresses it against the emerging scholarship in the Soviets and in the United States. In the obituary, Hasfeld laments the loss of a generation of scholars along with Tsar, which includes William von Bode, Max von Berchem, and Halil Etem. Nonetheless, in this ultimate encounter, he considers it dead. And for him, the loot of Tsar's library by the Russians and the hits of the facade of Mishatta at the Berlin Museum during the bombings of the Second World War were its markers. I quote, the famous facade of Mishatta in the Kaiser Frederick Museum from Transjordania, one of the earliest and most important monuments of Mohammedan antiquity, which was Zaire's pride, received a direct bomb hit. The most important of the antique carpets collected with infinite pains in long years were burned in the cellars in which they had been put for safekeeping. Zaire's private collection, though some pieces were saved before the war, exists no longer. His house too was looted. When the morning after his burial, June 4, 1945, his family was ordered to leave the house at an hour's notice. After that hour, works of art and ir irreplaceable library, studies, notes, photographs, letters, the whole scientific heritage was destroyed and burned. And thus has gone with them. Individuals may survive, but a living tradition of 300 years, which started before there was a St. Petersburg, Leningrad, and even a new Amsterdam, New York, is dead. The generation of scholars to whom Tsar belonged is gone. They were privileged, a thing unpopular today. Not that they had usurped privileges, they owned them as gifts of forces far beyond men and felt them as deep obligation. One cannot even regret or complain. Van, Van Berkham wrote to me shortly after World War I, why should one wish to live in a world that wants to revert to barbarism? And died, Cayetani died in self-imposed exile. Tsar too saw the doom coming, but had to drink the bitter cup to the dregs. The only thing spared to him was to see the looting of his house. The biographical journeys of both Dietz and Herzfeld and on an allegorical note of their expeditions. Herzfeld falls ill during his revisit to the Orient and passes away in Basel in 1948, where he goes from Cairo. Dietz passes away after a cerebral hemorrhage in 1961, imagining to be in preparation of a research trip to Asia in his last days. Both of these final journeys, imaginary or real, are in reminiscence of the scholarships of both Herzfeld and Dietz, to whom the Orient appears to have become both refuge and exodus. Richard Richard, uh, in its German form, Ettinghausen's obituary of Herzfeld depicts Herzfeld's connection to the traditions of Germany before the First World War. He wrote, having been brought up and steeped in the traditions of the Germany before the First World War, he was a firm believer in the aristocratic principle and it was not easy for him to adjust himself to different conditions. Without committing a cheap compromise, however, he tried to understand the new age and later on his new country, but his last years in a rapidly changing world were not too happy. Upon news of Dietz's death at age 83 in 1961, Haldun Tanash, his student at Istanbul University, wrote an obituary in the Vatan, in the daily Vatan of August 1961, titled Professor Ernst Dietz, one of the first people to introduce Turkish artistry to the European scientific world, has left us. Tanar portrayed Dietz as one of the most genial nature men of learning that he had ever known. He referred to the events of a decade ago as defamation. He noted that the attackers had personal inferiority complexes and blurred the public opinion 
due to their use of what it termed to be crooked feelings of national honor and demagogical language. Uh, this is so my presentation. Uh, I want to end with uh, reference to two uh, publications of mine. Uh, most of the discussions that uh, I referred to in this talk uh, is published uh, in the book uh, Art Histories of Iran and Beyond um, that you can also find online. Uh, and recently, it's not only there, it's an intellectual history through the biographies of these scholars, uh, but I am also working in how the notion of Orient, how the geographies of Orient change also through the course of the first half of the 20th century. And part of my uh, thoughts, part of my discussions are recently published in Journal of Art Historiography of December to. 2020, you can find it also online, uh, titled From Strzegowski's Orient or the Rome to Hans Edelmeier's Closest Orient. Thank you for listening to me and thank you for your patience. <laughs>